Hey, on the Black Cash, a Black Clash thing, I had one question for you because I was watching it with someone who didn't know who Billy Bowden was. Yeah. And they were like, what the fuck is that person doing? Uh, why are they dancing? <laughs> and I wanted to, and I had a thought, Now I'll get yours first. Where do you sit today on the antics of Billy Bowden? Are you a pro Billy Bowden? Love it? Or you're like, a, okay, okay, en enough is enough. So the, the thing is, I know who Billy Bowden is, and I had the same um, response as your friend. <laughs> <laughs> man sweet hey how are you going down in dunedin doing all right man doing yeah. all right how about auckland how's mighty auckland there you got a good background there that that's obviously the waitakere's are looking a little bit different what they used to look like they've uh they've yes changed, i used to have a real life background but then i'm organizing my shed which has all my stuff in it and um i had to resort to the good old pull down green screen nice bro so nice to see you. Haven't yeah, seen man. you or spoken and to yourself. you probably since pre-pandemic. Yeah, fuck yeah. And what a ride that has been. <laughs> but it's lovely. It's nice hearing you. It's nice seeing you out and about. It's uh, interesting seeing you in the uh, on the cricket on the weekend. This won't uh, this won't uh, go out as quick. But yeah. when we recorded this, you've just done the Black Clash. Good fun. Yeah, that that was the first sort of um, first piece of work for the year, and it was nice to. Um, do it with mates and it's always a sort of um working for the acc is um one of one of those jobs that i just would probably do for free anyway so it's <laughs> it's sort of the ideal one that's the um for people who don't know the acc started up i think as a cricket commentary and now it's the alternative co commentary collective or something and it's the guys from hodaki and jeremy wells and all those guys started it as it like an alternative to us uh, I don't know if it was Sky Sport commentary, but now it's sort of been taken on board by Spark Sport and by TVNZ, and they use a bunch of people and comedians in there to have a light-hearted look at various games uh, in a different commentary system. Yeah, completely. Um, originally, it was just um, set to cricket, and then um, they sort of expanded, and um, we do, uh, Ben Hurley, myself, and a guy called Chris Key do a rugby league podcast every week during the rugby league season. This year we've actually got some rights so we can commentate all the Warriors games and it's sort of they've been going from strength to strength really. They're, they're a great example of key of that sort of real Kiwi style of you pick something you love doing and it sort of appears like you're fucking around but the, people, yeah. the guys behind it are um, sort of really great operators and um they've set up such a wonderful system of um the perfect mix of having fun but also they sort of still align themselves very well on the corporate sector so they get good sponsors in so you can actually do it properly um and there was sort of a thirst for it because cricket's one of those things that's quite long and boring to actually even cricket fans <laughs> so so it it, having an alternative commentary where you just can talk rubbish because there's so many breaks between and cricket it it sort of brought a, a new audience in and I mean I I'm not across their numbers but I do know that they um they sort of are getting more impressive numbers than even they would they would expect so it's going from strength to strength and something I'm stoked to be involved in the objective will be obviously when the um, ACC has a bigger bigger audience than the main the main commentary. That'll be the that'll be the gold standard, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, that'll be intrig That'll be intriguing because um, I think because they they also came at quite a um, intriguing time where there suddenly was a gap in the market for that radio audience when radio sports sort of collapsed yeah true um, and and that was such a go-to that people would have on the background and now there is senz but um as with all online offerings uh, I, when i try and direct people to them who are maybe a bit in the older spectrum there is still that weird barrier of entry with streaming with downloading an app and yeah. then connecting it to a bluetooth speaker or your headphones or whatever and and i mean i myself use bloody carplay or android android auto in a car so there's no issue there but 
I think a lot of listeners still are about turning on the radio in the car. 89.4 so. FM, please. That's what we want to go to. <laughs> yeah, you're here with Drongo Blanco <laughs> on Fuckface in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> but um, there's still, um, yeah, there's still that barrier of entry, which I think is something um, is going to suddenly reach a mass and massive tipping point. I know that. I was thinking that even just with like my mum out at um she comes up and lives in Auckland at a little family place we've had and um just noticing now her TV stuffed out so I went and got her a new one and she's just asking for Netflix neon all these things to be set up so I think that 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 tipping point's about to come very fast yeah and yeah, then yeah. I. Ro- and then ironically, for the free-to-air TV stuff, it's stuff like this Black Clash that we were hosting that is these time-sensitive live events is what's going to really keep um, keep sort of viewers in on the, on, the, on the terrestrial TV. I'm in the same boat as you a little bit with the, the, the parent and the TV technology trying to explain to my 82-year-old father um, about... So this is how I do it, yeah? So for people out there who have got older parents who are trying to learn the new technology, I talk about the apps on the TV like a channel. You can go to yeah, TV exactly. Z, you can go to that, and you can go to TV3, or you can go to Netflix, it's like its own channel, or you can go to Spark Sport, it's its own channel, you know? So this is this is how I'm trying to, oh, you go to YouTube. And he's like, what do you mean? It's, it's a channel. Just think about like a TV channel on your TV. It's just you get it from a different place. That's it. It's just a different menu, and there's your channel. It's, a, it's the YouTube channel rather than the TV1 channel. So. But it's amazing. Yeah, that, it's amazing. What oh, I mean that do. that, and they. I mean nowadays they pretty much um, act like it. Um, although I, I, I suppose I, I'm become a bit of a nerd about streaming, and then I, I find it very interesting, like how especially with like live sport, how things stream differently. Like I got mum the TV that has Android TV on it. And the way they buffer sport seems to yep. stutter a lot more than when it comes through Apple TV, and it's just right. all those, all those little annoyances that are uh, actually suddenly put into the um, consumer's hands rather than being dealt with at a, at a TV end. But you're right. I think it seems that what you're saying about the live interaction. So, for example, you know, uh, depending on when this airs, a wee while ago when the uh, prime minister made the announcement to resign i went straight to the talkback stations you know because i wanted to know about it then it was an event happening then whereas you know any any television i watch that's not like a live sport or a news thing even a lot of news actually because you pick it up you know a couple of hours later online um i don't i don't watch live live as in live to air so but the, but the live but the live sport the sport is the one isn't it like you, we go to the rugby we we watch the warriors game we tune in for the all blacks you know we tune in for the because it because the, the terrible thing about that i don't know if you're the same is if i see the result of a game i don't watch it so now the old thing it if it's not live it's dead sort of thing and that yeah. um i think that what a testament to that was that amazing um black ferns world cup game where um, totally where TV3, I think, like, looking at it, it was the biggest numbers of all time for a, for a TV show, um, just because it was that perfect confluence of um, an amazing product, a Kiwi side, and it was on free-to-air TV. So I'm going to be really intrigued, actually, now um, Sky Sports collapsed. Um, what it's going to do for cricket, having all cricket on free-to-air TV. Mm. Yeah, I, I'm not quite sure what the details are, right? because – um spark sport has gone under i think you said sky sport i think it's spark sport oh sorry about. spark sport i'm talking about yeah where they, but there's they... still that there's still that weird thing where i think some black caps are on sky sport some other crickets on spark sport and it's, yeah so I, I don't it's know. it's it's the spark sport had the rights to all home games right. and any black caps game in england and anything outside of that, which is such a bizarre thing. And this is also where it, um, I think it becomes quite a punish for the viewer um, with anything. When uh, rights like that are split and you're trying to track down this and that, and then I wonder mm. whether, whether it actually over time will move to a model where the NRL has their app, like they do this in Aussie, where they have their app and they – you get that content through there. You get like the, the UFC. Cr- 
UFC yeah, yeah, we, we, yeah, the yeah. U, yeah, UFC is a great example where you can, yeah. um, you can sort of go tiers, you know, where you can pay a bit more and you get all those pre pre fights. <laughs> like, there's sort of the ones that go out on the pay per view. Then there's the that extra tier of stuff you can buy, and of course, the consideration is going to be the cost, though, isn't it? Like, do you have four different apps at twenty bucks a month, or do you pay fifty bucks to a place like? sky sport and get all of it yeah but but you're right this is the we're right in that process right now with technology eh? yeah and it's not going to be cheaper i am um, now i'm all set up with all the bits and bobs and i actually sort of finally cut the cord if you will and um and got rid of sky um in terms of the sky box but i still pay for sky now it it, it still it probably cost me ten dollars more a month than it did when i was just on sky Right. Oh, yeah, that's nothing. I mean, 10 bucks is nothing. I'm in a, I'm in a, a contractual negotiation with, not negotiation, uh, dispute. That's a much better word. With, uh, <laughs> <laughs> with Sky at the moment, because I was getting my Sky through Vodafone TV. Yeah. And then Vodafone folded. And then Sky started charging me more. And I was like, hang on, but I'm not your customer. Oh, and yeah. why is it more? I have no contract with you. What are you talking about? And that's now coming to the end. And ironically, in that period, I like you signed up for uh, Spa, uh, Sky Sport now, so I have it on the on the app. But they're still kind of going. You owe us four hundred dollars from all this, and I'm going. But I wasn't your customer. Hang on, I, I'm. I was not your. How do you get to decide as a company? We're just going to invoice this person who's never signed a contract with us. I'm like, I, I wasn't <laughs> using the service, and I wasn't your customer, and we agreed to no terms of delivery. What are you talking about? So, so at the time of recording, that's in dispute. Maybe once this goes out, <laughs> there'll be a resolution. We shall see. Sometimes things are easy to resolve, and sometimes <laughs> it's just a lot of admin, eh? Hey, on the Black Cash, a uh, Black Clash thing, I had one question for you because I was watching it with someone who didn't know who Billy Bowden was. Yeah. And they were like, what the fuck is that person doing? Uh, why are they dancing? <laughs> And I wanted to, and I had a thought, and I'll get yours first. Where do you sit today on the antics of Billy Bowden? Are you a pro Billy Bowden, love it, or are you like, a, okay, okay, en enough so, is enough? So the, the thing is, I know who Billy Bowden is, and I had the same um, response as your friend. <laughs> <laughs> so what, uh, what I think it... Uh, I suppose, like, I, I actually have a lot of respect for Billy Bowden as a, a cricket umpire, but I think what what a danger is, and this actually, I suppose, was almost a, um, an issue with a lot of sitcoms in the 80s and 90s with, like, catchphrases. It's like his catchphrase was this cricket, crooked um, finger uh, appealing um, when he put it up and he sort of had a... He, he would accentuate the cricket decisions. But now he has become a caricature of himself. And yeah. that's actually what happened with catchphrases is people go, oh, these catchphrases are getting a laugh. Let's yeah. just make it the only thing that person says. Eat rather my shorts, than, man. Yeah, all, all those little ones. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think then, it, then unfortunately, when you become a characterization, it, then starts to become a little tragic um right and I think so that, that's it. i think it's exactly exactly the thing i was saying it's like what i thought i was watching you know you you've described it better than what i thought but you know when you got that 60s rocker who's had the one hit and in the 60s yeah. you're like oh my god this is amazing and like by the 1980s you're like okay we're over this you know we've got you you've got your song you've got your hit you were great you won the grammy but like the same pants now that you're 74 years old and the same open shirt and the chains and the same song with the same looking at the 20 year olds now that you're a great grandfather. I'm, I'm over it now. That's sort of the vibe that I got when I was watching it in the weekend. It's like, okay, the, enough is the, enough. The only person who maybe pulled that off was Iggy Pop. Like, yeah. although he sort of ironically looked exactly the same. He sort of <laughs> always looked like a mid fifties guy, whether he was 30 or 65. Yeah, um, but no, it's, and that's why I think I struggle a bit to like, whenever I see all these, um, you know, like, I suppose classic bands of, of my tenure of coming through the eighties and the nineties touring again, um, I have this immediate thing of going, oh, I'd love to go and see them. And then I think about it and it's always, 
a bit tragic um because it's that thing of trying to hold on to yeah what you had rather than i suppose reinventing yourself i suppose someone who i always think of who pulled it off is snoop dog he's a um guy who i've thought has maintained so true to his brand and he's never felt like a characterization of himself even though he's sort of that is his brand yeah yeah yeah, um, but, yeah, like you see, you see him at halftime of the Super Bowl, and and he's wearing that um, ridiculous tracksuit. But you kind of go, yeah, but that's that's just Snoop. You don't go. He's trying to get back what he had in the nineties. You're like, that's Snoop today, still. Yeah, like he still manages to have uh, coolness, and I mean, even um, like my ten year old, who's big into rap and stuff. As um, he still fully rates Snoop Dogg. He doesn't think of him as an old guy rapper. Although the one thing with Snoop, if I'm honest, is the further the hairline goes back, uh, the the a little bit more ridiculous the dreads look. A little bit more. So oh no, completely. I was actually he's one of those dudes who, um, you go oh no he looks sweet, but then when you actually look closer, that the dreads have pulled the hairline back quite a bit, yeah. and um. Yeah. God, it'll be interesting to see him without dreads one day. I'm sure it'll happen, eh? No, it was it was it was fun to watch the cricket. And look, I know we're sort of already twelve minutes into this conversation, Di, but I just wanted to say I'm I'm so happy and thankful that you've joined us today. And I'm I'm really excited to see you. And you're one of those people on my radar that I'm always like, what's Di up to? What's Di up to? I'm just really <laughs> really happy to be chatting. I mean, almost like fuck the podcast. I'm just happy to say g'day and chat to you and see your beautiful <laughs> face. Oh, it's nice to be chatting with you as well. And um, it was actually, for me, with the Black Clash, it was awesome to um, get down to Christchurch. And um, I've always had, um, I suppose, I've had an interesting relationship with Christchurch. It was actually the first place I went after I had got on TV in um, 2006 when I started a show called Insert Video Here. It was the first time I'd actually realised that the show had had massive cut through and I was quote unquote famous in New Zealand amongst this young demographic Um, and um, like showed up to this Buskers Festival gig, which I sort of did for five years and there was this queue around the block and um, everyone was sort of in my face and um, Christchurch has been a place that I've sort of loved. I've then seen um, it was very much through my massive boozing days was when I was working down there. And so um, I was always out at night and sort of had saw this, which there is, is this um, rough underbelly of Christchurch. I mean, um, one of my first, um, my first, inklings of Christchurch was uh, going into Cathedral Square and seeing a um, a group of white supremacists um, intimidating a small um, Asian woman, which was quite uh, confronting. And um, then sort of coming back now and seeing how the slow rebuild has actually created a super cool city. And I'm now... S- I've been sober for three and three odd years. And so I love getting out during the day and walking around and it's like such a cool city for biking and scootering and then Hagley Park. So awesome. Um, granted after dark, it still changes and does have a little bit of a, um, little bit of aggression out there on the streets, but But menacing. Yeah, but menacing. But then sadly, I think unfortunately, welly from where I'm from, massively has that um and whether that sort of this post-pandemic testament or something or whether it's always right. been there i mean there's just um there just seems to be a bit of anger around new zealand at the moment it's within a small a small group but there definitely is a bit of anger out there you just said i've been sober for three and a bit years yeah. Does that mean drinking for you up until three or four years ago was a significant issue? And and I ask this, I ask this because I can speak to this as well. Uh, you haven't used this word, but I, I'm happy to, for me, about areas of addiction in my life and that kind of stuff as well. And if you want to talk about it, I'd love to hear your, your thoughts around that and, and your experiences as well. Um, I would say alcohol served me until it right. didn't serve me. Um, I, as, I mean, as with any, anyone, to be honest, who drinks, 
I think there is always a blurred line where sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. The good times were getting fewer and fewer. And when I say bad times, I don't mean bad times in terms of actual events. A lot of times it was just stuff that was happening in my own brain, like drinking, going out, and then having anxiety the next day, and I didn't actually say anything or do anything. And um, it was just having a negative impact on my home life, my relationship. I was probably, I was causing my wife more worry than was needed just through being a dick. (laughs) Like not, (laughs) my in a way, my issue was I was a good drunk. Um, Right, like a happy drunk. Yeah, like I didn't fight with people. I didn't get into trouble. But the problem is all my mates see the, the good times. They don't see me being depressed the next day, being emotional. Um, it um, it was just something that I couldn't, couldn't control. Um, when I was controlling drinking, I wasn't enjoying it. And when I was enjoying it, I was out of control. So it was wow. one of those things where... I also had, um, I have this, this sort of spiritual side to me and I was really getting back into meditation and things like that. And, um, I came to this fork in the road where I thought, look, if if I'm going to keep boozing, the meditation thing, the spirituality is not working. It's not going to work. And if I want to go down that path, I've got to stop the boozing. And, um, once I stopped the boozing, it actually, I mean... I work in an industry and especially starting out around stand up comedy where you get to work, you get given a beer, you drink, sure. you drink. Um, and I mean, I, I know many, many people in the industry who have issues with alcohol, some who have stopped drinking, some who haven't stopped drinking. And, and for me, it was just a choice I, I had to make. And then I actually found out my comedy got better because <laughs> after gigs, I would when I was working on material, I'd go to a gig, yeah, I'd do a show, I'd do, say, I was doing a 30-minute set, I'd do half of it new material, I'd get off stage and be so amped that I'd done this new material that I'd start drinking some piss and loving it. Right. <laughs> and then it would take ages to actually work that material. Whereas now sober, I'll go in, I'll record the set, I'll do the new material. I'll be so stoked, but then I'll listen to it on the way home. I'll make some notes before I go to bed. And then that new material that is gets the edges sanded down and becomes good material that is usable in most situations a lot quicker. Um, so, I suppose it brought a lot more professionality to um to me. However, I, starting out, um, I mentioned the show insert video here I was doing. Uh, I worked on C4 TV. The whole angle of that was that was a real boozy time, and um, especially TV because it was about pushing the boundaries. I was working on a music channel. We'd be filming s- stupid skits at the big day out, these sorts of things, things that just, um, uh, I suppose the, the, the um, audience we were aiming at was young cats who were getting hyped up and booze goes hand in hand with that. And I've, I've been lucky. I mean, it, it becomes apparent to me when I'm, say, at something like The Black Clash when we're leaving and we're, we're, we're bumping into lots of punters that are just really hammered dudes um, that I was, I in a way, I suppose, actually drunk so I could deal with um, meeting those people. Because then what, when are I... Are you saying because you had profile, it was sort of a, a mechanism to help you talk to people who knew your, knew your face and knew your name sort of thing? Yeah, like when I gave up drinking, I definitely realized I had a bit of agoraphobia. I actually right. struggled and struggled in right. very not not small groups of people, but very big yep. groups of people. And also when you're when you're a known as a comic, and I'm also my whole vibe as a comic, uh, um, the vibe I bought through Family Feud, Lego Masters, the more sort of family friendly shows is. 
I'm an approachable dude and I am yeah. an approachable dude and I'm a kind soul. So I do enjoy chatting with people, but people feel if they know you as a comedian, they need to come in super hot. So they come in just usually with a fully racist, sexist or homophobic <laughs> joke. Um, it's it's just so then you're in this awkward situation and in a way sometimes it ends up people just coming in berating you right um right. and the classic kiwi thing of their vibe is positive but if you just took the words that they were saying to you they <laughs> and a person from overseas would think this person's just abusing you Right. So, <laughs> you know, um, I was, it's funny. I talked to Paul Ego about this. It's like the contract we have, the unspoken contract we have, and you can call your best mate a fat cunt and that's fine. But if Australia, if a stranger calls your best mate a fat cunt, you know, that that's a problem. So probably yeah. what, what I hear you saying is people are approaching you as if they were your best friend, how your best friend might talk to you when he's ribbing you, but you don't have that actual relationship, but they just think they do because they've seen die and they know die and, you know, dies in their homes every week. And so that's probably the thing that people don't have the social cues for understand where that line is, is I know die like a best mate, but he's never met me before <laughs> versus, you know, my best mate who I speak to like this. Yeah. And, and a good example is I'm in the dairy getting uh, ice cream with my 10 year old son and dude is, oh, it's that fucking Lego cunt. Oh, fuck, bro. You're fucking, oh, fuck, man. <laughs> and it's like, I know what they're trying to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But to an outsider, it is just a stream of abuse. Yeah. <laughs> um, but that's, um, um, and Family Feud, the amount of times I was just called family cunt. Hey, it's the family cunt. <laughs> <laughs> Which is just, it's so Kiwi. And it is so Kiwi. To an American, that is very full on abuse. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, 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 yeah. So it's, I, I do know that, like, um, when we had Robin, um, who is the brickmaster on, on Lego Busters, just his, it was so, he's, he was Canadian, but they sort of do have the similar, um, word sensibilities as America. It was so, interesting watching him just navigate that um thing even like uh one that i that was the one that got me for him is someone saying fuck off to him like he said something that was unbelievable and someone just going fuck off fuck off and so and he's like oh oh um sorry sorry about that what <laughs> <laughs> just because they it's the well you know with kiwis the intonation is where the swearing is yeah, good yeah, or bad. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, like yeah, fuck yeah. off, <laughs> get the fuck out of here. Yeah. <laughs> so no, it's uh, and then and I mean I've spent enough time out and about and out out late at night that um I've learned that intonation very well. But <laughs> going going to Paul Ego, th that was a really good example because I spent. 10, 12 years on, on seven days as a team captain. And, and what really made that show hum was the relationship between myself, Paul and Jeremy. And that was based around that Kiwi idea of we were mates, we give each other grief. And as you were saying, you can give your mates more grief than someone randomly. So we would, we create that give each other gr grief and take the piss out of each other. But then when we're out somewhere at a restaurant, it doesn't even have to be a restaurant, we're having a bloody coffee at the airport, people come in and they, because they've watched you and they feel part of that, they come in super hot and they might not have comic timing and they'll just come up and go, oh, die, you're a fucking short cunt. Yeah. And it's just like, oh, <laughs> you know, there's no nuance. There's not a, it's not a good short gag. Um, yeah. And it just comes in so aggro. And then the thing is, your mates step up for you, you know? So then Paul and Jeremy would sort of circle the wagons and um, it's just that thing of, I know they're just trying to join in. But yeah, 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 yeah. Often it would be better rather than coming in hot with a gag, just come up and have a chat. It's a bit yeah. like selfies. Like I find selfies quite weird because I'll have selfies with people and it's so transactional. It's not like... Oh, they're coming up to have a chat 
and then we could have a little three-minute interaction or whatever. They just want a selfie, which then in turn just becomes this bizarre trophy that has a bit of kudos for a few yep. days or whatever. I can tick, I can tick that on my uh, on my Instagram. Good, I've got a, a quote-unquote celebrities image on my Instagram, yada, yada, yada. Yeah, and um, to me, that's rather than someone who came up, comes up and says, hey, I really enjoyed you and da-da-da, and then we have a, a chat because it might be something, they saw me in something random, like um, who knows, back in the day I used to do um, sort of pseudo-religious documentaries for the BBC. Um, wow. Which was... Um, I weirdly just thought of this for some reason. Um, I did a show called David and Mr. G, which was about David and Goliath, but it was set in an Italian mafia restaurant. <laughs> is this like a live action? Is this you hosting? What is it? No, no, it's like a, it's, it's a drama. And I was David, the kitchen hand, and Mr. G was the mafia boss, and I threw a potato out, out of a ladle at him and knocked him out. <laughs> And it was sort of, it was when, um, it was when the, the, these were all for Britain made in New Zealand where the, I think the church was trying to, um, sort of really give the, all the Bible stories a bit of pizzazz. So wow. it was a way for all of us young Kiwi actors to, to, um, get in a show and the, um, the director at the, at the time, um, I'll save his anonymity would be just having a ciggy and a cup of coffee he wouldn't even be looking at you and then <laughs> <laughs> with the with a ad had called cut the director would just take a puff and he'd go did you all say the right lines <laughs> and we'd all go yep and he'd go sweet let's move on which one of you is a potato slinger get out of my kitchen you huh do me a favor i cook potato i sling nothing not even leftovers Get your hands off me! You have the manners of a pig! And you have the manners of a chef! That's because I am a chef! It was me. I'm the potato slinger. No, it was, um, it was fascinating to hear your insights on the on the drinking thing as well. Thanks for sharing that. Because I've I've had a similar, I guess, run for me, but around food. Like yeah. not not very long ago, I very much made it uh realize that I I treat food the way an alcoholic treats alcohol. So when you used that word earlier about sober for three years, I kind of think about my journey as being sober for 12 months because I've, I've finally figured out how to treat food differently. And it, it makes me kind of laugh um, that you, what you did in the weekend was uh, commentate the black clash. Yeah. What I, what I did in the weekend was had a fashion show in my bedroom, trying on all the things that fit me 20 years ago. Um, like after talking to Paul Ego, I tried on, I, I now get back into my um, more FM, promo shirt which fits perfectly well yeah because in the past 11 months my outworking of getting that uh, you know addiction in case is losing 50 kilos you know so it's like i i it resonates with me and i was interested in your path because i'm always sort of of the belief and all the reading and learning that i've done about it is for me at least it might be different for you um because you actually because you haven't used the word addiction so i'm not putting that out there but for me the addiction's always in the car park doing press-ups yeah, you know, so it's all, always sitting there, going, "Yo, you think you're strong now? I'm gonna do some press ups. I'm gonna get stronger, and then there'll be an opportunity." And only twelve months, and I can I can see that, and I can see sometimes no. where I oh. you know, fall back into those habits and that kind of stuff. It's a, it's a it's a danger for me. Oh, mate, I'm so stoked you're um on that path, and I um I mean I've I have my issue right is I um everyone's searching for moderation. But yeah. yeah, moderation. I don't do moderation, and that's why I'm a. <laughs> but that's why I'm a good performer because yes. I don't moderate myself. I just let it all fucking hang out when I get on stage. So yes. it's that thing of that. This is where I went. Look, I don't moderate, so I can't moderate um, booze. It is so. Whether you, I mean, I definitely would have an addiction sort of thing to it because I do know that if I, you know, went, oh, I'll just, I'll just get hammered with the boys tonight. Then that means tomorrow I have three to four beers to get over the hangover. Then yeah. I have one to two. Then I go, oh no, I'm okay having one to two. Then I have another big one. It's this whole cycle. And 
I actually hear you on the food, man. I'm actually at a point where I um I'm the heaviest of of been and i'm because i i thought oh i'd give up the booze and uh, then you just have a six pack eh? but then i went oh no <laughs> booze has got heaps of sugar in it now i've got a sugar issue yeah and yeah. for me for me we 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 have a um we have a little sort of treat box for the kids because our our thing is I'd rather our kids have like a little bit of chocolate each day than thinking it's forbidden then eat a whole family size bar when they go to a party or whatever but sure. then i but i actually struggle with i'll easily can wolf down three chocolate bars and then then i go then i go oh fuck it i'll just start tomorrow i'm a real start tomorrow guy <laughs> i'll just start tomorrow and then um it was actually a phrase i was i was doing some boxing training with monty beatham and he goes to me he goes to me all you got to remember is if you slash one tire of a car, you fix that tire. You don't go and slash the other three, which is right. just what I was sort of doing, you know, where it's, oh, fuck it, one tire's gone. We may as well do the other three, you know, rather than just going, okay, I had I, I had a bit of a binge on the chockey, just stop, you know, which is hard to do because I've actually found getting my eating in line because I'm definitely – I hate the idea of diets. I like the yep. idea of lifestyle because I, I think that's actually how you make a, agreed. a lifelong change. So yeah, going, agreed. oh, I'll do a five day fast and drop five kegs. That's not, you're, that's not going to help you. It's also it's also not the best thing to do when you possibly have got seventy kilos to lose. Yeah. <laughs> Five day fast, I'm going to lose seventy kilos. Yeah, so. that, but that, but that's the thing is, so it's actually trying to do do it do everything not slowly but the best things do happen slowly is actually yeah. make that so then your cues change and what's harder is you're going oh, i can just give up booze but you can't just give up food you, because you God, need I you. food I, I i love you <laughs> i love you more than anything in the world because this is the thing that i and look i'm not doing this from a victim point of view right like i own my my stuff and yes there's things in my past that led me to where i am today but i still own being an adult and having autonomy but this is the biggest point i try and educate people on is if you're addicted to cigarettes you don't need cigarettes to live the rest of your life you know and we can go about going into like uh what do you call it when you uh, withdrawals and that can be dangerous with alcohol and stuff but you don't need cigarettes to survive you don't need alcohol to live you don't need you know cocaine to live yeah but you do need food so people with food addictions and fuck you all if you think this is just the wokest conversation in the world now but I'm, <laughs> i've lived it for 40 plus years um imagine saying to an alcoholic uh you know that thing that you can't not do you should stop it other than having some every day to help you survive. Yeah. You know, that that's the that's the difference between food and all the other ones. And also without getting deep on the um Oh, go deep. Go the, deep like on the, con the not as not conspiracy train because it's actually out <laughs> there is in particularly a western model of um I suppose food capitalism, the system is geared against you because yeah. everything that is made that is in a packet is made to make you want more of that through yeah. the right combination of salts, fats, and sugars. So it's that thing of it does make it so hard to to get on top of that. And like um I've I suppose my um my angle in it is I've just been trying to move towards that whole food situation if you know what i mean like just trying For to sure. trying to cook eat single ingredient things good produce that's real hard when you're outside of your home environment <laughs> if, yeah. you know like and it's easy to it's easy like it's been a bit easier during summer because we're at home and my kids like cooking so we'll barbecue and make salads and veggies but then even when i was traveling down to christchurch everywhere you look it's something that sets you off and if you're someone who struggles with moderation or struggles with eating it's very easy to suddenly you've blinked and you've had that extra thousand calories you weren't trying to have yeah 
Yeah, no, it's a, it's really interesting insights you've got there, bro. And and again, thanks for sharing with uh, with us. Um, but I'm also thinking that sort of the podcast is about talking to comedians about oh, comedy. Oh yeah, so that's it's... right. And we're we're, 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 we're covering everything, but <laughs> yeah, no. But look, you have talked about performing and stuff, so I do want to ask you some questions around that. And yeah. one of the questions I want to ask every comedian is, when did you know you were funny? Like, what was the moment that you went, uh, oh, I can make people laugh? Can you remember it? I was five years old and yeah. I wanted to be, I wanted, I didn't know what a stand up comedian was then. Um, I just made probably about, I can't even remember exactly what I was saying or doing. It was probably more physical, but I made about four or five people laugh. Um, right. And that gave me this insane feeling of, I suppose, what is dopamine? It gave me a massive dopamine hit. And I was like, wow, I love performing. Um, I love making people laugh. Not so much performing, making people laugh. And then I come from an acting family. Whenever I was acting in anything, I had to be funny. I couldn't stop right. it. Even, I mean, God, I was in a play by Brecht called Baal. And Baal was a horrendous human being. Who And there was a... A rape, uh, an implied rape scene in this play and they cast for some reason they cast the woman I was meant to be um, molesting was a foot taller than me and she's now <laughs> gone on to be a police officer so she can handle herself and visually looks <laughs> like she can handle herself I'm two paragraphs into this horrendous scene and the entire crowd is screaming with laughter. And, <laughs> and afterwards, the um, my theatre teacher goes, "You are a comedian. Right. This there is not one ounce of humour in this scene, <laughs> and no one has ever got a laugh from this scene. <laughs> and with you, you are a, a comedian, and um." Then it sort of kept getting amplified for me. I like I knew I I always had this issue, I suppose, with comedy of I was like, why am I not doing something? Like I saw my like my mum was an an amazing lawyer. She then moved on to being a judge, has done so yeah, much amazing. in terms of youth justice, um the confidential listening about gang members who are abused in state care. She's, you know, doing really heavy mahi for um, the for people in New Zealand who need help. And then I I was doing a gig, and after the gig, it was just at the Classic. It wasn't a big gig or anything. It was just a, a, a standard comedy night at the Classic Comedy Bar up here in Auckland. And afterwards, this woman came up to me, and she went, hey, um, she, she was relatively young, you know, and sort of late forties. And she said, my, um, my husband passed away recently and, um, I have been really struggling and I loved your set. And when you, what you were doing just was really cracking me up. And when I was in a state of laughter, I forgot everything else. Um, and I felt good. And then that made me realize that laughter and laughter is based a lot of the time on surprise. You hear a combination of words you weren't expecting. You see a movement you weren't expecting and you crack up and it takes you straight out of anything. You know, people can be at the, a funeral and get the giggles. Yeah. And unfortunately, people often think that laughter is negative, you know, like you, you could get the giggles at a funeral and you're not actually disrespecting the person who's passed away. <laughs> you might be thinking about them and how they'll be reacting to this. But that moment with that woman made me go, shit, I'm actually doing, this is benefiting people. And it is like thinking about seven days. It was one of the few TV shows where people would come up to Paul, Jeremy, myself so much and say, this is the only show we watch with our teenage kids. And this is like a connection for us. And wow. it's those things that go, oh, no, actually doing something. And you don't, whatever you're doing, you can be helping people. And I suppose that 
that then got me really jazzed and sort of made me double down on it. And I also, I mean, I how just, far through your career, how, tell, that that story you just told about the woman coming up to you, like how far through your stand up? Oh, that, that was been? that was early as that was right. early as wow. that, that was when I was sort of known, you know, not fame. I was had I suppose a bit of fame within the industry and within right. people who attended live comedy. Um, so regulars sort of were like, "Oh yeah, this dude's." cool he's crazy or yeah, whatever yeah, yeah. and um and so it was it was early on it, w- it wasn't when i was sort of ha- had a public name for myself so doing th- doing that and i mean i've i've had so many disasters comedy wise over the years of f- losing twenty thousand bucks trying to <laughs> trying to do edinburgh festivals um these things that really hit hard um and shocking gigs that for some reason i still just stayed at it because i knew i had to do it and the, is it because the, do you ever do you ever think about that woman like literally about that woman like if if a time is tough do you go this was tough but i know there are other people and you think because i i have moments in my broadcasting career like specific moments where sometimes i go like this might not be working today, but remember that person and what they said to you about what their family went through and that, you know what I mean? It's like, it's like, it's not always good, but those, those key moments sometimes are, oh, uh, are anchors to keep you on the path. Oh, I, so this is one of those memories, you know how you have, I reckon there might even only be a dozen, you know, those memories that are exactly like playing back a videotape. Like I would mm. try and think about other situations where it's just a blur of still photo shots, you yeah, know, yeah. like you'll think about a party or whatever, and it's just like scrolling through photos, but you can't actually remember conversations or anything. This is one that the whole thing just sits in my mind and I would wow. f- like just see her. If I saw her now, I'd know exactly who she was. It was wow. like I was thinking, um, I was trying to think back sort of um, of memories of my dad. And there's just this one memory of going to this cafe in New Zealand called The Renown on Lambton Quay and having uh, like a one of those pink slices that have jam in the yeah. middle yeah. and sort of that uh, wavy pink icing on top. Yeah. Have I and, told you I've got trouble with food there, dog? <laughs> putting that picture in my head. No, I'm kidding. Get, go, go, keep going. Um, but but then I was like, Dad used to take me there quite a bit, but I can just only remember it once. Wow. And I can really remember that time. And uh, that had got me thinking about why I wonder some memories stick or they don't stick. But then I yeah. wonder whether that, memory i have is actually quite a few times put into one because the gotcha. most un, the most unreliable thing is an eyewitness <laughs> yeah so you might have got that sliced dozens of times but now it all in, in, encapsulated into one time and that's the time you went with your dad yeah like one time i was sitting in the booth and then one time yeah, i was, yeah, remember yeah, yeah, standing yeah. to order and then they've all just become this sort of this this packed little packed little event but no i mean comedy has been the in a way the hardest and easiest thing I've ever done in my life. And I'm, I'm at a time of the year where I'm gearing up again to, um, uh, I've got a lovely sort of run of live gigs, um, in Taranaki up here in Auckland, um, one up North, I'm sort of getting back on the scene a bit. And, um, and it's a time of year where I'm putting together material, freshening up material, doing new material and yep. it's stressful. Because it's like, oh, shit, I'm starting again. Like I've got a gig next week at the Classic where I'll just, I'll go out with all new material because I just, I like to spice stuff up. Um, When I'm doing long sets, like I will be when I'm away, where I'm doing sort of 30 to 40 minutes, I like to have some classic stories in there that are um, maybe a year or two old. But I do like to have a lot of new stuff because I find the new stuff is what keeps you fresh which is why i suppose bands like um i think the chili peppers just did this recently um came over to new zealand and they played all new stuff and right. that the crowd might hate that but 
they that's probably what keeps them jazzed and ironically yeah. this is the difference between music people just want bands to play the shit they know and comedy they want the comedians to do the shit they don't know so we're sort yes. of caught in this um this interesting thing and i mean any most comedians who i know really struggle if they know the there's an audience who've seen them before and they are going to go out and do material that these people might have seen before. It really stresses me out. And um, one gig I did recently, just at an RSA, I knew when I went out, I saw this big group of people and they had been at a gig for me maybe a month and a half before. Okay. And so about 20 minutes of the set they would have seen before. And then afterwards, I was chatting to one of them and um, went, oh, yeah, um, how did you enjoy those gags the second time round? And they like, eh? <laughs> oh, did, oh, have, yeah. have we seen them before? And I was like, oh, wow, this is just um, me um, being buying into my own hubris of the, thinking these people listened to me way closer than they actually did. And yeah. then that, that, that plays into a... Um, a Buddhist quote that I think of every day pretty much is people don't remember what you did or what you said. They remember how you made them feel, um, nice. which is so true. They left that gig going, oh, he's bloody funny. We like his <laughs> comedy. But they don't remember the, you know, the ins and the outs of a joke. Like they might remember I was talking about a parsnip or something, but they don't actually remember any of the punchlines. They're right. like, Oh, that parsnip thing he did was funny. Because, you know, if you've ever heard someone who's gone to see a good comedian and they're telling you about them, they make an absolute shambles of trying to describe anything they actually heard. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, yeah. Uh, for me, it's annoying sometimes if I'll see a great comic, then I'll be to a mate, oh, you've got to see this comic, now I'll take a mate along and the comic doesn't do the bits <laughs> that I want them to. Um, uh, also, and, for the up, for the upcoming tour, just so people know, are parsnips like a big through line in the whole show? Like, is that something that's going to be a big landing point for people to be aware? Because, like, if you're like not a pro parsnip person, will, would the comedy still land with them this time around? Yeah, in fact, if you're not a pro parsnip person, you'll probably enjoy this um, even more. I think, um, yeah, I don't know. I par I parsnips. Um, they're actually brought to my attention. <laughs> uh, We're saying parsnips too much, Don. I know. Sorry, we said parsnips too many times. Parsnips, <laughs> definitely one of those words that once you start <laughs> saying, it has no meaning in reality. And it's hey, also me, let, let, a heinous let, let vegetable. Drag, let, let me drag it back. No, evil. My kids say that. I like them. Anyway, you're talking about comedy. You're talking about the early start. But tell me about your first gig. What happened? Were you were you were you great? Were you average? Was it a bomb? First, that was the very first gig. First gig was, was in nineteen ninety seven and April the twenty seventh. Uh, wow, well, there come, you go. We'd come up from um, Wellington as part of a uh, like university comedy competition. There was um, an improv night. There was a stand up night, and I started doing stand up with a, a very close friend of mine, Anna Kennedy, and um, she was sort of an amazing improviser. She um, then went on to be very high in the advertising um, world, and now lives in London. And she, um, her, and I had a double act, Diana. Um, oh, lovely little play on nice. words there. And hang I on. just you said, hang on, did you say nineteen ninety seven? Yeah. Wasn't there another Diana in 1997 that had some issues around cars and tunnels in France? Wasn't that 97? Yes. And do you know, we were so arrogant, we didn't even think about that or mention <laughs> it in the gig. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Which, to be honest, um, even now, if you mention that, you'll get a boo. So oh. <laughs> it's the one topic you can't go near. But Fair I enough. actually did a bizarre amount of jokes about Brian Dennehy, I remember, um, who, if people don't know who Brian Dennehy was, he was an actor who, I think he was in Rambo and he was in every TV movie and he either played a child molester or a policeman, like there was no in between. And um, I got fascinated with him and so I was very Brian Dennehy focused. Right. Um, 
Anna Kennedy have managed to somehow get a uh, inflatable life jacket off the aeroplane, and she um, she pulled the tab on it to end our set, and um, it actually went way better than I was expecting because you don't <laughs> often see one of those self-inflating life jackets up close, um, and. It so it went okay. We were like eighteenth out of um, eighteen people, and there there were um, it was emceed by you and Gilmore, and oh. what actually gave me um, what gave both of us because we kept performing together. What gave both of us a lot of solace was after the show, Ewan came up and he went, "You guys have something. You've both got to keep doing comedy." And rest in peace, you and he he was yeah. always a, a great um, uh, a great proponent of uh, our comedy and then my solo comedy. And so yeah, did that gig. Then the classic opened um, like six months after. We came up and was doing we're doing late shows. I started doing a lot of shows down in Wellington. There was sort of a, a quite a good comedy seen there with a couple, a couple of people like Jermaine Clement and Taika Waititi and Brett McKenzie who had sort of vaguely I, gone I, on I've, to... I've, I've never heard of these people before. I don't know who you're talking about, Di. No, you might... Um, some Someone out there might recognise their face, but they've... <laughs> um, it was sort of a very um, healthy time <laughs> for New Zealand comedy. And, and for Oscar um, winners. And for Oscar winners <laughs> and for people who may have turned their craft into a bit more of a bank balance than myself, but they yeah. um, they were all sort of uh, friends who I knew through school and, and plays and stuff. And so there was a real cool little scene and then moved yeah. up to Auckland, um, integrated myself in the scene up here. Um, I lived with Reese Darby, who has been a close friend ever since. Um, was gigging with the great types like Jeremy Elwood, Justine Smith, um, Michelle Court. Um, there's such a cool scene and such a cool group of people that you not only wanted to get on stage, if you weren't on stage, you just wanted to be there to watch your mates, support your mates, have a few beers. It's one of those great industries where it sort of was competitive because you obviously wanted to be the funniest on the night, but it also was really supportive. And um, Scott Blanks, who runs the comedy club, sort of become... Mm-hmm became a, 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 a really almost like an uncle in a way because like my parents were down in, in, in Wellington. I would have been 19. And um, he created such a positive environment where you could push the boat out creatively. Um, you could have some fun, but he kept a safe, happy environment there. So now I, I think back on those years very fondly. I mean, a little side note, I noticed uh, Michelle A. Court the other day on Facebook wishing uh, Ewan Gilmore, who you brought up, uh, a happy 60th. So it would have been wow. 60th yeah. for Ewan just uh, within the last three or four weeks or so. So, yeah, that was a shock. Um, down in Port Waikato, I remember the news well, actually, when that when that all happened. And you mentioned, um, other, it's just interesting when people move on, eh, in this world. It's just a, it's a strange thing. Um Let's talk funny, though. We're talking about death. It's like, what am I doing? <laughs> I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, you talked about getting laughs when you were five and loving it. Do you remember in your household, uh, like comedians when you were younger? Like, can you remember finding people at a certain age and gravitating towards them on an album or a tape or a CD uh, that might have influenced you in the direction you ended up going as well? Yeah, my sort of, I suppose, my formative comics were, I remember at primary school, um, a mate of mine, Daniel Cottle, got hold of a tape recording of Eddie Murphy's Delirious, Delirious, the first one, yeah, Delirious. Yeah, best ever. The red leather suit. Yeah, and he was, it was on, um, it was just on a, um, just an audio tape and just listened to that over and over, barely understanding half of it. And um, <laughs> it was that I had a Monty Python record. I'd sit around with sit with my friend Joss and just listen to and listen to. Then when I was um, traveling overseas um, with my folks, they wanted me to get a, a present for my friend Andy, and um, I bought him. Uh, um, he's not in stand up comedy. 
I bought him a Robin Williams live at the Met um, right. VHS. And then brought it back, and then I would just pretty much go to his school, every, go to his house every day after school, and watch that. Um, then in my teens, I became obsessed with Lenny Bruce, and I had a, um, I had a book that had um, transcripts of all Lenny Bruce's wow. comedy, and I'd just read that. My dad, my dad had that, and I just would take it everywhere I had and just read it because I was very much a um, anarchist punk um sort of person in my teens very anti-establishment he's the um, guy then isn't he if that's where you're going and he's the yeah guy. so <laughs> uh, i was listening to dig kennedy's crass uh, i was very much down that i was um um allergic to organized religion i was allergic to <laughs> capitalist government i was just sort of so I was down that, and Lenny Bruce, as you say, just massively ticks that box on the comedy side of things. There's a maybe a, a big faction would say he almost wasn't a comedian. He was sort of just uh, really pushed the boundaries. And I find that quite strange because that that side of things never translated into my comedy. Um more i i suppose my style was probably more influenced down the eddie murphy robin williams line right. of things uh, why i loved robin williams and this is something that i think translates to all comedy is i'd watch his live at the met i was a 12 year old in new zealand before the internet so he made so many jokes about american politicians and american figures and i had no idea who they were but I still found them hilarious. Interesting. And that, to me, showed why he was such a good comic because his delivery, everything, you just knew what he was saying was funny and you wanted to be part of that. It also made me learn a lot about American politics. Um, if you, that, so you had some people, do you, did you like either uh, lean British, lean uh, American, or did you just kind of lean funny? If it was funny, that was the main thing. If it was funny, it was the main thing. However, right. I, I'm half Welsh. I'm my my. I, I would watch Open All Hours with my dad. Um, he put me on to uh, all of the um, young one stuff. Um, oh, best ever. Then, then. Uh, um, so, not, so you gravitated to Rick, obviously being the anarchist that you were. Yeah, Rick, old um, Neil and his lentils. Um, and then sort of more contemporary than that, I was very much into um, Noel Fielding and the Mighty Boosh. Nice. Um, and that I, I would listen to the, I'd listen to the Mighty Boosh every night going to sleep. I'd watch the Mighty Boosh. Um, I saw Noel Fielding live when I was over um, doing a, a festival in um Melbourne in like 2003 when he was really starting to pop off. And I, I, I suppose I love the eccentric whimsy of British comedy, which American comedy doesn't really have. Yeah. Um, that's an interesting, that's an interesting observation. I mean, like it's, it's, if you think about all those crazy, for example, uh, comedic performers from back in the day, I do think like, you know, Spike Milligan, I do think like, um, um, Monty Python, and I do think about open all hours. I do think about not the nine o'clock news. You know, they're the ones where that craziness seems to come out. It doesn't mean it's not in America, but whether it's my own bias to lean British or whether it's just they do that better, I, whimsy is an interesting word when you associate that with the UK comedy scene. So my take on that is in America, it's about money and um, America was very into testing funny before it went on TV. So right. things scripts got written they got tested in front of people they got changed they got the skits got worked um in britain it they was more yeah and they got slicker in britain it yeah. was more here's the money you need to drop off six episodes of comedy yeah and and that's what they did the bbc i think had a lot more trust just in the performers so they, you know, would... they, they, they either had more trust or they didn't know what they were doing and they yeah. just happened to strike gold. Like, I'm pretty sure John Cleese still tells the story of whoever the BBC controller was at the time. Um, 
you know, the letter saying this is not going to fly about Monty Python, and he's got it on his wall still. So, yeah, either they had more trust or they went, oh, BBC Charter, tick comedy, that'll do, yeah. you know. So either way, though, it gave them the freedom to do what they needed to do. But that's the thing is the BBC person going, it's not going to fly, yet that still went to air and yeah, they true, got true, funded true. again. Whereas in America... Yeah, yeah that's not going to fly can actually stop something because yeah. I don't know whether it's America has that flip side of having more money. So therefore they go, Oh, we'll just pull a, pull a pin on that. But, but they're also Americans are more puritanical as well. I mean, as much as they say they got away from Britain to get like religious freedom, they're more puritanical. I mean, they, they blur out butt cracks. You know, I don't yeah. know why they blur out butt cracks. So they're more puritanical and I think they're more, um, you know, maybe it's the conservative Christian nature of a lot of American politics, but they want it to be family, family friendly rates more highly, at least in the commercial sense. Then like, like if we just constantly go tick funny, like I remember John Stewart often talking about, he was talking to um, Bill O'Reilly, I think about um, how they how they do what they do, or maybe it was another Fox News, and he says their filter for what they do on the Daily Show was, is it funny? And then it goes into the news, where I feel like some of that kind of puritanical sense from America is the first filter might be, how, what's the biggest audience we can get, i.e., is it family friendly first? Is it going to not offend anyone first? And then they put that as their first filter, whereas the UK sounds more like what you're saying is their first filter is, is it funny? And and then from there, the other ones come. Yeah, the puritanical thing's huge. I mean, look look at American tech companies are the only place in the world where they're developing a filter to tell the difference between male nipples and female nipples so <laughs> that no female nipples appear on social media sites. Like, you know, it's absolutely ridiculous. And, I mean, it's what they, what they were saying that... I was reading somewhere that, that America was up there as being the most fundamentalist country in the world in terms of numbers of people who identify as a fundamentalist religion. Um, so the puritanical thing definitely falls on that side because you forget outside of those little coastal havens in America, they're deeply conservative. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, the coasts aren't the Midwest and those places are... Um, I want to know from you as well, uh, your view on hecklers. Are you a get rid of hecklers? Are you a put up with hecklers? Are you a encourage hecklers or are you something else when you're on stage? This is an interesting thing because I would always tell people, don't worry about heckling. The comedian has bought enough things to say <laughs> because the comedian has enough words to fill the time. Because yeah. There is often, I think, people are heckling from a place of of good. They think they're helping. They want to add to. Yeah, and then they feel quite um, sort of chagrin when they realise then they get massively taken down. I don't agree with hecklers. I don't think you should get rid of hecklers. I've had heckler that has derailed my set and I've had hecklers that have made it better. It's it's not a perfect science. Where I personally find it hardest is if you've got, if I'd say a demo, is say a woman between 45 and 60 who's had two bottles of Pinot Gris. Um, <laughs> because if a man's heckling me, called, I can... Called, called Karen. Yeah. Called, I can, Karen. If a man's heckling me, I can go them, right? Yeah. But when a woman's heckling me, it's there's still a fine line and it becomes right. really awkward. And then I'm hoping that there's a Justine Smith or a Michelle Accord behind me on the lineup who can come out and just go them. Because you still need – they're still paying for tickets. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. often with alcohol, there becomes an entitlement situation where people feel entitled. I bought a ticket. I bought my drinks. So I'm entitled to talk. Yeah, right. Rather than, no, you paid to come in here, you're on our turf. Now. And it is, it, is funny, it is funny in a club, and I've talked to other comedians about this for various things, how, how they think different rules apply. Like if you'd bought a, a seat in a plane and you got absolutely shit face, you'd easily be ejected and removed from that plane if you weren't suitable to fly. You know, if, yeah. you, if, you, if you were going to your kid's 
uh, I don't know, auction at their primary school and you got absolutely shit face and you're calling without, you'd get removed. But for some reason, they think there's different rules apply because it's a comedy club. Absolutely. And um, it's, it, it differs wherever you are, whether you're in a rural bar, whether you're in a comedy club, um, whether you're at a corporate gig. And my thing, I, it's not a perfect science. You're never going to get rid of hecklers. Yeah. But I think if people go to a comedy show realising that the comedian has enough words to say and that they don't need to talk. And the, the, my main issue with hecklers is I'm there to entertain however many people are in this room. We've got 100 people, we've got 50 people, whatever. If I'm just talking to this person, everyone else misses out. Sure, it might be funny for them, you know, and, oh, does bloody Dave's stag do, mate, ripping to Dave. Sure, it might be funny for Dave and his mates. But what about the people who are there as a couple on a date? What about the... Dad and mum, there, you know, uh, they're missing out because I have to deal with this person. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's a really good point. Hey, um, lots of international gigs coming through New Zealand in the next few months. Anyone you're going to go and see as an audience member? Any things you're, any comedians today that you particularly look to and look up to and <laughs> think, yeah, they're a bit of all right? You know, it's probably the healthiest. There's so many I can't even actually get my head around who yeah. is coming and when they are coming. Um, Cause you've sort of got this mix of Oz. I, um, Bert Kreischer is actually someone I'd really like to see live. I love, is, I love Tom and Bert. You, li you, you listen to two bears. Yes. They yeah, um, love it. Best podcast on the internet. His Bert Kreischer's sort of unwavering positivity and love for all of humanity is something I find <laughs> really interesting that is almost to his own detriment. Um, Do you know, hey, here's something. I didn't think about this. You are talking about British whimsy. Bert has that whimsy. He's he got does. that whimsy. Yeah, he's got that lighthearted, fun, don't give a fuck, you know, but still the, the, the skill of comedian at a very high level. Yeah, he is a great example of someone you'll go and see and you'll walk away not knowing one joke that he said that you would have had a really fun time. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's all about a fun time. So, no, definitely, I think um, Bert Kreischer, like you've got the um, – Jimmy Carr must be coming here soon or is he I think he's just even? been. But yeah, or I just, think he's been. just been. But, yeah. like, he's an example of someone I massively rate but I don't necessarily feel I need to see live. He's an interesting um, one, eh? Because he's a real, uh, he's a real setup. He's a real gag, 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 gag. He's not a storyteller. Whereas Bert, I mean, you were talking before about how people come along to see um, a band play their classics. You know, Bert Kreischer and the Machine story. My understanding is pretty much at the end of every set, that's his encore is the Machine yeah. story, which is a thing that broke him all over the world. And so he does repeat that, and people go wanting to hear him repeat that. Whereas Jimmy's, so he's a storyteller. Jimmy's more like. Set up gag, set up gag, set up gag, set up gag, pun, 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 set up gag. Uh, now let's invite the heckler. See someone who invites the heckler. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I can o I can only do set up gag for 20 minutes, really. Right. Um, I, I prefer the story. And like a great example of um, how um, Bert doing the machine story, I saw uh, Charlie Murphy, Eddie Murphy's brother. Yeah. Um, when he was over here maybe 12 years ago. So the Chappelle show stuff was all very fresh. Um, and he came on stage and he went, right, here we go. And for five minutes, he did every catchphrase from the Chappelle show. <laughs> he, he brought up a picture and then would just do the catchphrase. He did it to the point that it got annoying, but it shut everyone up. Because yeah. before the show... He um he walked on stage and people were, Charlie Murphy darkness they're just yelling out all this stuff and then I went wow that's a really good way to deal with a catchphrase just do five minutes at the top punishing everyone with it shut everyone up and then he did a really good set. Um, if there was someone like, is there a comedian out there at the moment that you look to and go, yep, they're the pinnacle for me? Like that that's a current performer anywhere in the world. That's a, it's a tough one because I, um, I find it very hard to, what, 
uh, very hard to gauge comedians based on Netflix specials, if yeah, that makes sure. any sense. Like, yeah, yeah. There's sort of comics I'd like to see in. Um, there's a guy Mark Norman I'd quite like to see in um, in the flesh. Um, I don't really have anyone to be honest that's fully jazzing me right. on <laughs> on a comedy tip at the moment. Um, I suppose because mainly I end up actually consuming comedians when they're on podcasts. Um, yes, good point. I so we get a lot of con we get a lot of content on an almost weekly basis, oh, which is very the, natural and very um, off the cuff. And I've got an answer for you, Theo Vaughn. Theo okay. Vaughn is the yep. comedian I'd like to see in in person. Um, he is. I really enjoy people. Um, uh, Josh Thompson falls into this category of Theo Vaughn, who your average person might think they're just a stream of conscious idiot, but they're extremely smart. And everything is quite well thought out. Yeah, great podcast as well. Speaking of podcast, Theo Vaughn's podcast. Yeah, and he is he is probably he's one of the top uh, performing guests on podcasts. Like he um, going he, on other people's ones. Yeah, yeah like he. Um, uh, I mean, there's no one who'd make Joe Rogan laugh more than Theo Vaughn. I would True. say. Um, true, like true, in true. terms of just honestly, like, I suppose we're going back to whimsy. I like him because his, he is all whimsy. He'll start yeah. out with a premise that might initially think, oh, shit, he's going into some deep racist territory here. Then it just turns out to be a stupid, whimsical story. Um, he sort of, he yeah, he's, he's someone who I've enjoyed. And when I watch film, I find film stand-up still still doesn't get to the 100 percent level yeah. um so he's someone i watch and i go oh he looks really i think in a live audience i'd really enjoy him i i think it's the same i talked to paul ego about this the other day as when i came and watched a couple of filmings of seven days the actual stuff that doesn't make it to screen is often the most enjoyable part i think it's 100 oh, percent that special 100%. hey look um I just wanted to ask you as well about sort of your approach to comedy. You've talked about who you follow, what you do. Are you someone who sits and writes and tries and rewrites and tries? Are you an improv on stage going, oh, shit, that worked, and you've recorded it, so you start working it? How's the way that you actually look at how comedy works for Di Henwood on stage? I try and think I think about what's pertinent to me, um, what's been happening in my life, um, often – um, as I mentioned, and I have random interactions with people. I will start there. I'll write some gear, some stories. A story for me will hopefully sit around five minutes and it will have sort of about five to ten touch points in there that are gags of such. Yeah. Um, I'll go out and I'll do that. I'll then, um, I recently I've ha got a mate who I sort of write with and um, I will um, send them my set, like I'll record it or um, I'll write down and go, hey, can you think of any angles on this? And um, strangely, the angles that they have sometimes won't be the joke, a joke I'll use, but a joke they might write will set me off in another direction. Right. I actually find the third eye or the second eye looking at my stuff is often better for kicking me off and going, oh, shit, I haven't thought about that. And um, I, the technique I use when I'm writing is I think of a topic, I write, say, space. I write A to Z on that topic, like A, asteroid, you know, try and think of a word for each letter. Then I pick one of those letters, then I write another A to Z. Um, and then that just creates so many topics and so many words. And out of having to think of a word for a, a letter word, like for each thing in space, is a great way of coming up with words that are funny, like parsnip, right? Like out of a vegetable. <laughs> if you think of vegetable words, parsnip is a funnier vegetable than most vegetables. Yeah. Um, so... That that's sort of a base technique for me when I know I want to write about this topic, but I don't know how to get started. That's how I get started. 
That's amazing. It sounds so precise. And actually, yeah, I mean, I can imagine that being in any kind of artistic form, whether people are writing or whatever, that could just be a an interesting thing to do. Hey, look, Di, you've given us longer than I said we were. I appreciate you uh, to the nth degree. Um, you say you're just in the process of setting up 2023. Where do people come and find out more about what Di Hen was up to this year? Basically, keep a lookout um, on my Twitter and Instagram is where um, I'll be putting up posters. On my Insta, die underscore Henwood is probably the best place to go because they'll just in my little, all the little boxes there, there. I'll put up the posters for where I'm coming. Otherwise, come up and say hi if you see me on the street. And Pat, I'm loving the work you're doing. And um, hopefully, let's have a chat a little bit closer. Last time, it's been three years. <laughs> oh, it's been ridiculous. Look, I love you to bits, brother, and I'm so happy to have um, talked to you. Thanks for joining us today, and until next time, um, stay funny. Awesome. You do. See you, mate.